Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Today's episode of Hack the Entrepreneur is brought to you by Acuity Scheduling. Acuity Scheduling makes scheduling easy. Clients can view your real-time availability and self-book appointments, fill out forms, and even pay online, eliminating 100% of the drudgery. To learn more and get a 45-day free trial, visit acuityscheduling.com slash hack. That's A-C-U-I-T-Y scheduling.com slash hack. Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur. I'm so glad you decided to join me. I'm your host, John Naster, but you can call me Johnny. My guest for today is a software developer slowly turned entrepreneur. He spent several years working as a manager for a billion-dollar payroll company, and in his spare time, he played around with some ideas. Early 2009, he creates his first online product that fails to garner any attention or traffic. So back to the drawing board, he went for two more times before hitting onto something good. He is now the founder of BidSketch, which is an online proposal software for web designers. He bootstrapped BidSketch while working full-time and was able to grow it into a stable and profitable business to the point where he was able to quit his job, surpass his previous income, and enjoy the freedom of being an internet entrepreneur. Now, let's hack Ruben Gomez. Today's episode is brought to you by Acuity Scheduling. When you book appointments or meetings, you know how challenging the back and forth can be to find the right day and the right time. A huge part of running a successful business is having meetings and also networking to reaching out to people and just sitting down for 15 minutes or 20 minutes on a phone call and seeing how you can help each other. The only way to get a yes from people when you do outreach is to have a simple scheduling system set up. What if you could never ask what time works for you again? Acuity Scheduling will make your scheduling easy. It works with your existing Google Office 365, iCloud, or Outlook calendar. Plus, your clients can view your availability and self-book appointments immediately. It helps you avoid no-shows with automatic text and email reminders. Plus, it's extremely simple to use, and they offer phenomenal customer support. Here's what I want you to do. Visit acuityscheduling.com slash hack. Paid plans start at just $10 a month, but listeners of Hack the Entrepreneur can access a free 45-day trial of Acuity Scheduling stress-free schedule management. That's a month and a half of scheduling bliss, absolutely for free, just by going to acuityscheduling.com slash hack. That's A-C-U-I-T-Y scheduling.com slash hack. Welcome back to Hack the Entrepreneur. We have an extra special guest today. Ruben, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So let's jump straight into it. Sure. Ruben, yep. as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? I've thought a lot about this mainly because... I feel a good strategy is to find what's working and just double down on that. So I think it's the same thing with, uh, with sort of mindset, right? For me, I'd probably have to say focus is the thing that I seem to do better than a lot of other people that I know. A lot of people seem to struggle with focus. So focus in, in your work, on your products, on, or just like literally being able to like sit down today with a coffee and actually just stay focused all day and be productive. I think all of that. So what I hear a lot when I listen to podcasts or when I talk to people, you know, and I ask them how their product is going later on, it's often the same thing. They get distracted. So they have, they say, uh, oh yeah, I have uh, ADD and you know, I jump on new projects and get excited about this or that and sort of move on. And I have a lot of products, stuff like that, right? 
So I tend to have one product. I tend to just have a few things that I'm focusing on as far as tasks, just, you know, one or two things for the day. I see things through and I ship. So what, what I'd say is kind of interesting about that is that a lot of people will say that, yeah, well, I get bored. And so it's hard for me to just do one thing, right? The, th- <laughs> the thing is that everyone gets bored. <laughs> the, it's easy to just let yourself get distracted and go do things. So I don't focus better than some people because I just, I prefer just to work on one thing or nothing else enters my mind or there are no distractions that hit me. I get excited about new ideas all the time. I have to actually fight these urges all the time, right? I sometimes hit days where I don't feel like working on on the important things, but I still do it. So that's the difference, right? Yeah, no. And dealing with the boredom, because everything, no matter how much you're into what it is you're doing, there's a certain point where the excitement kind of wears off Mm. at least temporarily and through phases where I still got to stay focused. I still have to work. Right. (laughs) It's just a part of it, right? Like I love podcasting and there's so much besides having these like brilliant conversations with people like you, there's so much around it that has to be done to get out three shows and record and book and publish three shows a week. (laughs) Right. So the people that, the people that, easily get distracted with new projects, either end up having a lot of new projects and products and things going on. And they basically half-ass everything because you can't do a really good job if you're not focused. Your attention is split and, you know, the quality of whatever it is that you're working on isn't going to be that great. You're not going to be able to market those things that well, not as well as if you're really focused on one thing or maybe two things. One thing I'd say is best. So yeah, it's stuff, new stuff, new projects come up all the time. It's just really about considering which one is the most important, which one is the better thing to do long-term wise, right? Like you also have to think about the reward aspect and sacrificing on the short term because a lot of the things that are really valuable long-term just basically take a lot of work and you don't see a payoff for a long period of time, which a lot of people, it's hard for them to get motivated to do day in and day out. Like you said, they'll get excited immediately and they'll put in a good effort for a little while. But then when things get tough, they'll slow down, they'll move on to something new or basically abandon what they're doing or just sort of put it in a maintenance mode or something like that. Yeah. And it's such bad news to most people that everything that has that big reward at the end takes a lot of work. There's no easy way. There's no just here, here, do this, do these three steps and you will be a success. It just doesn't work. Right. Right. So no one wants to hear that. <laughs> way, way back. No, absolutely not. Right. Everyone wants the, wants the easy, what's the, what's the shortcut? Exactly. How do I win really fast and easy? I think way back as early as I can remember in like school and things like that. I just saw that people really struggle that basically you will win a lot of times if you just show up, if you just ship, Right. So that doesn't even mean doing an amazing job a lot of times, which is sad. And that's only the case because so many people fail to finish, right? Obviously, you want to do a good job so that you have more success. A lot of times you won't see a certain amount of success if you, if you don't put in the work and, you know, come out with a quality product or anything like, or something like that. But yeah, it's amazing how far you can get just by showing up. <laughs> so true. So true. So let's go back a little bit to, I guess, where you started to show up was probably where this happened. But from the hundred or so conversations I've now had with entrepreneurs, there seems to be this time in every entrepreneur's life when they realize one of two things. Either they have this calling to make a really big difference in the world, or they simply cannot work for somebody else. Could you tell me, Ruben, 
if you fall into one of those two camps and when you realize this about yourself? Yeah. I think for me, it was, I just had trouble working for other people. It was very rough. So ever since I was young, I always had this idea that I'd own my own business and I'd do something in, you know, different things before I got into computers. It was real estate and, you know, like rentals and other things like that, that I was thinking I'd do. And then later as I got into computers, at some point it became, well, I could build software and just sell it uh, when I was working for companies that were paying a lot of money for software that at the time I was looking at and I was maintaining and, and seeing that this is really bad software. I can build something better and make some, I'm sure I can make a lot of money if I build something better, which was uh, the wrong way of thinking about it. But that's what I was thinking at the time, right? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, so when I got into computers early on, I was learning how to program and that was exciting. I got a job doing it. I really enjoyed it. And then as I, as I got promoted and moved away from what I wanted to do and even programming while still fun, it sort of just became, okay, what's the new language that I'm learning? It's just, it was kind of like more of the same. I was writing for something new. I'd spent many years doing it. So I, I, I was managing a team of, I don't remember how many people, but managing managers. And uh, at that point, I was just not very happy. I was making more money than, than I'd ever made in my life. But that made uh, no difference at all, right? Like zero. I remember, I remember talking about one of the first, I think it was around the time that, that I was doing bid sketch and it was starting to gain a little bit of traction. And I remember having a conversation with a friend telling him that, you know, I think I'm just going to really invest more time in this. And I think this might, might I might be able to get it to a point of where I can quit this job. And I remember him saying, why would you want to do that? Like you have a really high paying job and you're, you know, like director level and all that stuff. And I remember telling him, I'm like, I have, I don't care about the pay at all. It makes no difference. They could, you know, they could double my salary tomorrow and it wouldn't make one difference. I'd still be extremely unhappy. <laughs> Funny how that works. Yep. The things that it seems from the outside that those are, that's what we strive for. That's why we go to college. That's why we do good in school all the way along. That's why we do kind of what we're told, right? Is to get that sort of like director sort of level position. Right. That's the end goal. And you're just like, well, you're, uh, it's not really what I want. <laughs> no. And I mean, early on for me, I grew up poor. I didn't have a lot of money. Nobody in my family or none of my friends had money. Right. So um, to get to a point where I was making $8 an hour when I finally got to like $8 an hour, it was amazing. It was a lot of money, more money than anyone, than a lot of other people that I knew were making. Right. So when I started moving eventually into computers and started making more money, started reaching levels to where I, there was definitely nobody that I knew, no one that I knew made those amounts of money. And I felt like, wow, if I can just make whatever amount, right? I don't remember what the amounts were. If I can get to this point, then I'll be set. Then I can, you know, vacation all the time. I can do this, that, right? I had all these ideas. And then I'd get there and I was like, mm, no, I think I need to get to the, right? It was always oh. something new. And then when I got to a, a level to where it was like, yeah, you know, I could do a lot of things that I wanted to do easily. In reality, I could have done them anyway before if I approached it the right way. But, you know, buy a nice car, buy a nice house, travel, et cetera. You know, when I got to that point, it was like, wow, I'm, I spend most of my time at, a, at an office working with people, you know, that I don't really understand. They don't truly really understand me. I don't uh, applying other people's policies that I don't generally <laughs> agree with. Right. Just doing things that I don't like an environment where politics is really heavy. This is not, this is not ideal. This is not what I want to be doing. The worst part of all of that still was having to do what I, uh, what somebody else tells me, right? right? And this, that goes back to not, just not being able to work for other people. Right. And when you were making or going or thinking about making the transition even to full time with your own stuff, with BidSketch and your own business, did you think I'm going to make a lot less money overall, but it doesn't matter because I don't have to deal with the politics 
And also, who am I to run a business? Like, I know how to make software, but really, can I run it? Like, was there this sort of thing in your head thinking like, maybe you're just being ridiculous, Ruben. Maybe you should suck up this really kind of really great paying job that I have and just do it. No, I actually never had that thought at all. Like, nice. maybe I should just do this work because it didn't matter it, to me. Yeah. To me, yeah, I thought initially, you know what? When I quit the job, I'll quit it at a lower salary level. So I knew that because I didn't need all that extra money. And mm. it was completely worth it to be making less money and have all that freedom, right? I was working for my freedom and to work for myself. So it was just a very clear thing to me that it was just something that I had to do. I get to that point. And then when I did quit, I wasn't making as much money as when, you know, as having that, that job, but then it didn't really take that long to where I did. And then I, you know, <laughs> surpassed that and buy a lot nowadays, which <laughs> is great, but that wasn't really the reason why I started doing that. I would have been totally happy. And I was, you know, during the period where I was making a lot less money. Yeah. Beautiful distinction. And I think if you're doing it just for the money, you're not going to have that level of success. Just in that way, I really think you have to be doing it for other reasons. Like you're going solo and bootstrapping a business. You really need to have other motivators. And also, as you said, you were, you knew you were going to take like a cut in income and you were okay with that. And I think that's where people really get stuck. They want to take that leap, but first they're like, I got to replace this income first and then I'll do it. It's like, well, no, like maybe you don't need that right. new car. Maybe you don't need that new, maybe that's the problem. Maybe like so many people I talk to and myself included, it's like I had to seriously reduce expenses and stuff for the first year to do that and to be comfortable doing it. And then of course, then your income increases again and you're good to go. But right. it's hard to really just expect to be able to quit one day and just, oh, everything's just, this is how much money I make still. It's like, yeah, that's really tough. And then you get stuck in it for 20 years later. You're like, well, maybe one day. It's like, well, <laughs> that day was 20 years ago. Yeah. The, the problem is that the more money you make at a job, the harder it is to sort of get to the point of where you can quit. Because generally most people's expenses go up with their salary, Right. So they get more expensive homes, more expensive cars, and then they need the minimum that they need so that they can quit is a lot higher than somebody who's just starting off and has a lower paying job and all that. Right. Exactly. And then it's about taking a really hard look and seeing what you can eliminate. Well, maybe the car payment or maybe, you know, some of the bigger stuff, things like a mortgage payment is a lot tougher because you have to sell, right? Right. Or just leave the property, I guess, and get it foreclosed. <laughs> but... Yeah, it starts to get a lot more difficult. The, I think the, the longer, you know, you've been working for different companies and the more money you're making and you ha uh, if you have a family, right, all these things make it a lot more difficult. But in every situation, you, there's always room to cut and to eliminate things. Exactly. And so counterintuitive. The more money you make at your job, the harder it is to leave. Right. <laughs> if I just make this much money for a year, I can save all this. Like, no, you'll get a new car, you'll get right. extra trips and you'll, <laughs> yep. your, your expenses will go up. Yeah. And the long, so the more money you need as a minimum to be able to quit your job, the less likely it is that you'll get there because work, doing things on the side when you have a job is hard. So if you need a higher minimum, that means you need to go for a longer period of time. And basically the point is to not run out of gas and not give up before you get there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Excellent. So let's move on to say work and what it is you do. So there's, we learned what you are good at. You're good at the focus. You're good at determining what to do. And every blog post now, an expert is talking about 80-20, mm -hmm. right? Do 20% of the work, get 80% of the results, do what you are good at, delegate the rest. Ruben, while you are working in your business, can you tell me something that you are absolutely not good at? Something that I'm not good at. I'm not good at, <laughs> I'm not good at doing uh, videos. Uh. I'm not good at doing, so a while back, a friend of mine asked she was putting together these video courses, right? And she asked me to do a short, like six minute video to where I show my face and I'm talking and all that stuff, right? I did it, but it was, 
it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> so t- bad at it. It just took so long. And yeah, I'm sure if I, you know, if I do it over and over and over, I'll get better at it. It'll get easier. And but it's not a strength. It's not something that I want to do. I'm, you know, so right now I'm bad at it. Same with public speaking. I've, you know, I get offers from time to time to uh, to speak at conferences or something. And I always decline because it's not my, not my thing. Really? It's not something I look go forward to. It's not something I want to do. So mm. you haven't done it yet. Nope. Nice. Hmm. Interesting. That's cool. That's something that I've struggled with myself. And this year I've decided that I'm not going to say no mm. anymore. So I'm actually just accepted last week to be on a panel for the first time. Oh, wow. In the summer. I think that's a good pod- first step. I think so too. And, but if it would have been actually speaking, I would have just said yes. And it would have, I probably would have like puked or something like right then, <laughs> just out of nerves as soon as I right. typed the email. Yes. But I just, yeah, I, to me, it's something I need to do with the podcasting right. or something yeah. I want to do, I guess. So, yeah, well, that's the thing, right? Do you want to do it? I do. I've talked to a lot of people about it and they've said, well, you need to conquer it because why don't I want to do it? Right. Like why, yeah, why do I keep saying no? And public speaking is terrifying. It, mm-hmm. I don't want to do it because ah, it'd be a really big thing. I'd get, you know, so if I look at it objectively, I'd say, well, you know, that's an area for personal growth, right? That's definitely where I can improve and I should just do it for the challenge and all that stuff. But the thing is, not all challenges are worth taking. For some people, if hmm. forwarding your personal brand and you have, a, let's say, a podcast or something like you do, it makes sense. And if these are the things that you want to do and you eventually move in that direction, it makes a lot of sense. But for me, it would be more of a distraction. Say I did it and then I did it again. And then again, I started to get better. Then what? Then nothing. <laughs> like this <laughs> doesn't dramatically impact my business. It's not, I don't want to do anything related to a personal, you know, my personal brand or anything like that. Right. And there, and when I'm doing, when I'm spending all the time doing that, there are a lot of other challenges that I'm not, that I'm not taking on. True. It's a very logical way of looking at it and it's smart. Would you think to ever put somebody or bring somebody into your company that does do that PR, the speaking, the getting out there in front of people and sort of building the audience? That's maybe. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to it. I would think that would be a benefit, right? If you're hiring people, it's always good to bring in somebody whose best strengths or your weaknesses lie. Yeah, excellent. Okay, one of... As entrepreneurs, as human beings in general, one of our greatest struggles is the fear of being wrong, making mistakes, and failing. This is probably why we're both freaked out of speaking. But can you tell me within your business how to be wrong and still work through it? What do you mean by how to be wrong? Like to maybe, if that's how you do it, say, follow your gut on, say, a new part of the product, a new idea you guys are go- you're going to go forward on something that just comes back that you were all in and being like, this is the right direction we need to go. And then the market or whatever it is you use for metrics come back to you in a month or two and like, Ruben, uh, no, that's not how it works. Mm. And you're just like, oh, wow. I just, I was so confident. I was so, and not get totally just sort of wiped out or sidetracked by it and kind of knocked off your game for too long. Got it. So this probably has happened to us with some big features that we work on, right, for the product. And so we, especially with bigger features, they can take a lot of time to develop, create and certain, it's always best to iterate, to release quickly and iterate and get feedback and all that stuff. But sometimes you're just not going to be able to do that very quickly. You're not going to be able to do that in a week or two. Mm -hmm. So in the past, that's happened with features. That's that's happened with pricing, really. Early on, probably spent maybe, I don't remember exactly how long, maybe the first year, maybe the, I think it's the first two years with pricing that was just totally wrong for my product. Grown a lot faster with better pricing, but didn't. It was a big mistake. You know, so these big mistakes happen from time to time. Little ones happen all the time. And you just kind of brush those ones off. And how does it affect your confidence to then you make a huge pricing error for what seems like a long time in hindsight, but then 
to go and change that pricing and to confidently do it now or to do it again, does that get harder when you have that mistake sort of lurking over your shoulder? Or do you now know what you did? Like, do you go back and learn and figure out why you made that mistake? I was trying to go back and learn, but I see what you're saying. So with, let's say, pricing being wrong, I didn't know it was wrong until right I, until I, I got to a point of where, oh, this works a lot better. And I sort of, you know, <laughs> gave it a thought way back, but really didn't follow through and, and test it appropriately to know that this was go- going to work better. As far as investing, thinking that something is going to work really great, spend a lot of time doing it, test it out, and then, you know, it not work out. We've had those situations too, to where it was one of the things. I think importing, we spend a lot of time coming up with a way to import and manually help people out and copy their content in and set up their account and all that stuff. Maybe we did it the wrong way, but we tested this for a few months and it just didn't work. There was no impact to trials at all. So in that situation, yeah, it's a downer. I really, you know, my, my initial thought, I don't think of it as, oh, that didn't work. Okay, now let's move on. I approach it that way. But uh, my initial thought is, I really want this to work. Shoot, <laughs> why is it not working? And what can we do to make it work, right? So then I try changing a few things. If I really believe in it and keep pushing forward. And at the end of the day, if it just doesn't work, you know, all right, this didn't work. It was, you know, it's a good try. Maybe there's still room for something different, but along, you know, with the same overall general direction. But then, yeah, I'll sit down and really analyze. Like in that situation with the, with the onboarding, I went back and looked at the templates we were importing. Look at the types of customers that sent in. Look at what went right. Because oftentimes there is something that, even if the whole thing doesn't work out, especially if it's a big thing, there are some small things that do go right. So I try not to ignore that. A lot of people just sort of say, oh, this didn't work. And the whole thing is just wrong and bad. And it's always wrong going forward, right? Or somebody else says, hey, uh, thinking of doing this, something very similar, right? With the onboarding and doing the content, blah, 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 for a different type of product. What do you think about that? Oh, that doesn't work. We tried it and it doesn't work. Uh, Maybe it works for them, right? Maybe it's maybe we did it in a different way where it didn't quite work. But it, I think it's important just to sort of uh, maintain the right perspective on things like that. Yeah, exactly. I love your, oh, I wish this would work. <laughs> what can we do to make it work? That's right. Uh, your, your attitude is, it's good. It's not black and white. It's not like, and the way you say, well, parts of it work. It's not just like scrap it all. Let's go on to something else. That's probably kind of the mindset you would need to do this stuff successfully. One of the things that recently I love, I I heard from, what's his name? He's the, he leads growth for HubSpot. I think for a new product. Oh, you know his name? Mm. He's, he's pretty new. I I can't remember. Yeah. Anyway, he, he has this thing to where he, after something works, why did this work? Right. Three questions. I don't remember all the questions, but why does this work? And the other which I kind of try to ask. But the other question that, that's really interesting is, where can we apply this as well? Where else can we apply this? So basically looking at, you know, at something that's worked, finding out why it's worked, and then looking around on other parts of the application site, whatever, in different areas, and seeing how you can apply that as a, still as a test, because it might not work in different areas. But I love that, because you could do that both with successes and failures. Yeah. And I love the way it ties back to your one thing, which is find what's working Mm. and double down on it. (laughs) That's exactly how you opened this. That was awesome. Right. Yep. So it sounds like you have, you came from growing up from a place where you didn't have any money. You went up in a career that was really good and paid you a lot. And then you left and moved off and did your own thing which now makes you even more money and is more successful and allows you freedom to do other things and also to focus on this. So Ruben, personally, could you just say stop right now and look behind you at where you've come from, what you've accomplished and what you've achieved in life and in business and tell me if you are happy with where you are at this point. Yeah, I'm very happy. I'm happy. 
but I also want more, right? <laughs> so I'm not satisfied. So I want to continue learning, continue moving forward. And for me, one of the things where I know I'm moving in the right direction, I'm doing the right things is one of the signals for me is whether or not I'm learning a lot. It's not necessarily money because a few years back, I remember revenue was growing at a nice pace, but I didn't feel like I was learning a lot. And I wasn't feeling very good about the business. And again, money didn't matter at that point, right? Then I started learning a lot again, doing new things. And I felt better about it. And since then, that's just, you know, how it's gone. Nice. Nice. I like it. Happy, but not satisfied. But hopefully you are at least taking the time day to day to really appreciate what it is you have accomplished because it's a lot and it's really, really impressive. Thanks. So Ruben, we've got to, in passing, talk about your business. Can you specifically tell the listener where they can go find out about you and your business, please? Sure. For my business, BitSketch, you can go to www.bitsketch.com. That's the best place for that. Or on Twitter. It's just BitSketch on Twitter. For me, it's Earthling Works on Twitter. Earthling Works. Excellent. And you also have a personal blog. Yep. It's uh, extendslogic.com. I don't blog there very much because one of the other things that's very hard for me to do, has been for a while, is write, writing. Writing is just a very slow process, so I don't, I don't do it that much. Yeah. But I do post. I try to post from time to time. Excellent. And BidSketch does what exactly? BidSketch is proposal software used to create. It's a web app. And it's used to create really professional looking client proposals and helps people do it much faster than uh, what they're generally using. Typically, it's Microsoft Word or Google Docs that they're using. So when they switch, they find that they save a lot of time creating those proposals. Excellent. And it works with FreshBooks. Yep. FreshBooks integrations. Very cool. And, and a few others. That's awesome. Yeah. FreshBooks has been the show sponsor since October, I believe. So, oh, yeah. And they, still, and they still are every single month. So... That's why I saw that on there. I was like, that's Very cool. Nice. That's good. <laughs> so Ruben, thank you so much for your time. This has been a lot of fun. And please just keep doing what you're doing because it's awesome to watch. And yeah, you're just, you're doing really cool stuff. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure, sir. And thank you so much, Ruben. That was, that was a cool conversation. And I think I failed to mention in the introduction that Ruben's actually hasn't even really been working for the past four, five, six weeks. He's been moving. His wife had to move across the country and work, and he picked up and moved too, I believe, all the way across the country. And so he's just, and he's so thankful that he has a business that allows him to completely have the freedom to choose when and where he works. And I just, it took us a little bit of psyching him back up to get him back into business mode, but it was a lot of fun. And I do thank you for that, Ruben, because, because you said a lot of smart things and the conversation really grabbed me many times, but he said one thing, he said one thing, didn't he? He did. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. Not all challenges are worth taking. For some people, if forwarding your personal brand and you have, a, let's say, a podcast or something like you do, it makes sense. And if these are the things that you want to do and you eventually move in that direction, it makes a lot of sense. But for me, it would be more of a distraction. Say I did it and then I did it again. And then again, I started to get better. Then what? Then nothing. And that's the hack. <laughs> Then what? Then nothing. <laughs> I love that. Ruben, I love that. And all challenges are not worth taking. It's absolutely true. All skills are not worth learning. You need to find out what it is you want to do, where you want to be in a year from now or six months or three years from now, and then Find your path, figure out the things you need to learn, figure out the challenges you need to accept to get there. But they're not all for you. Ruben doesn't want to learn how to public speak. Ruben doesn't want to learn how to podcast, although he's really good at it. He should podcast. He's got a great voice. He's funny. He should, right? But he doesn't want to. And there's no end benefit for him. So he doesn't need to. It's a challenge he doesn't need to learn. 
I don't know how to code a website. I don't need to learn how, and I refuse to learn how because I can go off and do things and face challenges that I need to face. You need to do the same thing. And Ruben, I thank you for that because that's awesome. So that was it. We did it. Hack the Entrepreneur. Again, been so much fun. Have you been to the website? Checked it out? I think you have. Probably. Stop by. Hacktheentrepreneur.com. Get on the email list. I'd love to be able to talk to you every Sunday afternoon. And if you have a chance and you're on a phone now or on your computer, hacktheentrepreneur.com slash iTunes. I would love to hear or read a review from you on iTunes. It helps the show so, so much. And it, I would just really love it. There's like 260 reviews on US iTunes right now, and it blows me away. And I thank you. If you've left, you, left me one, I thank you so much. If you haven't, please, it literally takes, it'll take a minute and a half if you write a short one. I'm, I'm cool with a short one. I really am. <laughs> but thank you either way for listening. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for joining me. I do appreciate it. And please, until next time, keep hacking the entrepreneur.